The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine, the Cloverdale Rodeo is this weekend, but not all business owners are excited about it. One local restaurant is fundraising for quake victims in Nepal. And Cook Whitlam residents are given the chance to experience an earthquake. And welcome to BCAT Magazine. I'm Estefania Duran. And I'm Amar Khan. The community of Cloverdale is saddling up for yet another rodeo. Locals are already showing their country pride by wearing their best boots and cowboy hats. But as Reagan Hasegawa reports, not everyone is excited about the rodeo coming to town. When you think of the Cloverdale rodeo, you probably think of this. And this and probably a lot of these. However, it seems the effect on the community can be mixed. Aaron Hotel owns two local restaurants in downtown Cloverdale, and although he appreciates the value the rodeo brings to the community, he says the event often has a negative impact on his business. Uh, the downfalls are it's, um, it draws a certain kind of um, clientele to the area, so people that are looking to um, party and drink and, and might not even be from the area. So this is my other business down the street, the vault, and um, a couple years ago it happened, they'd come through, uh, smashed the whole front window, there was plants everywhere, and I guess they'd found them down the street. And other businesses have experienced negative consequences as well. We're very slow because people go to the rodeo or go out of town and people aren't visiting downtown Cloverdale. But despite these problems, rodeo organizers say the event has a positive impact. There's a lot of economic spinoff, and I think it's pride. In Surrey, there's not a lot of stuff that's prideful in Surrey. There's a lot of bad press in Surrey. And if we do it right, it gives a sense of community to everybody. McSorley says the changes to how liquor is sold on site and increased security at this year's event should help combat problems with alcohol and vandalism. We're doing bag checks at the gates now, and we're trying to make sure that we, we, that we control the crowd in a better manner. The rodeo brings in about $6 million to Cloverdale and Langley every year. With that kind of economic impact, many see this standoff as a draw. Reagan Hasegawa in Cloverdale for BCIT Magazine. Owners and customers of a local restaurant are raising money for friends and family in Nepal. My co-anchor Amar Khan has a story. It's, 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 you know, there's no word to explain. I mean, it's, you feel like crying and uh, you feel you know, devastated. Cafe Kathmandu owner Pradeep Sharma held fundraisers to raise money for victims of the April 25th earthquake. My family, my, my friends, some of my friends uh, are injured, uh, but my, not my immediate family members. Yeah, it definitely it's my, you know, uh, it's my responsibility to come up and help them in, in the way whatever I can. The restaurant raised over $11,000 that was handed over to the Nepal Cultural Society of BC. Cafe Kathmandu is one of the oldest uh, restaurant in Nepalese restaurant in uh, Vancouver. So they are doing a fundraise for uh, Red Cross uh, and the Children's Society. The crisis affected the families of the owners and patrons, like Sheila Sanju, who lost contact with her brother after the most recent aftershock. And for everybody, please save my country. Save my family. <laughs> to save everybody, please. Nepal experienced another major earthquake, a 7.3 aftershock following the earthquake the past week. Cafe Kathmandu posted these posters showing people where they can donate their money. Sharma pours a cup of good luck tea in hopes that his country never endures similar pain again. Amar Khan in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. With growing concerns of a possible earthquake in the Lower Mainland, first responders are working to raise earthquake awareness in a unique way. Katie Youngblood has more. These people are experiencing an 8.0 magnitude earthquake, except this is only a simulated situation. 
The Quake Cottage is an earthquake simulator. It's touring around the province for emergency preparedness week. The main goal is to teach people how to properly secure their belongings inside buildings to prevent injuries. I think people would be very shocked at a large earthquake. We haven't had a large devastating earthquake in, in living memory. Uh, so people by and large are indifferent and it's a, it's a challenge for first responders and emergency managers like myself to convey that message to get people prepared. The earthquake in Nepal was a 7.8 magnitude, while the Quake Cottage simulates an 8.0 magnitude, which is shocking to many people. Well, wow, it's, uh, it's pretty astounding. I've never been in actually in a, uh, in a quake before, and if that's what it's like, man, I want to go home and just bolt everything to the walls. It's a wake-up call, yeah, for sure. While the simulator demonstrates a quake, it doesn't eliminate the need for people to make their own survival plan. It doesn't prepare you for your needs, your basic needs. If a uh, large earthquake was to strike with catastrophic effect, would you have the supplies in your house to be, be able to sustain you and your family for two or three days? Safety professionals hope with more resources and the chance to experience a little shakeup, we'll be more prepared than ever. Katie Youngblood in Coquitlam for BCIT Magazine. A local transgender activist is working to support her community through her unique YouTube channel. Shaquille Majuri reports. Local transgender activist Jasmine Khan is brainstorming ways to help transgender people through a popular YouTube channel. My YouTube originally started as a way to vlog my transition from male to female. Part of me knew that I'm doing my transition alone. I don't want anybody else to go through the same thing that I went through. And so I want it to be as thorough and just honest as possible. Jasmine has become the face of the Vancouver Park Board's new trans initiatives. She's used the media coverage as inspiration. You know, now becoming the face of the Parks Board's new ad campaign, and YouTube has always been a resource. I thought, might as well just start it up again with better cameras, better editing, better everything, and just making it, making my channel now a resource for trans people. Jasmine has been working closely with the co-chair of the Trans Inclusion Committee, Kai Scott. Many people don't understand the severe amount of barriers and the ones that she's personally experienced have been really tough. The hardest part for my transition was the fact that I was, I didn't have support. I was on the streets, my parents had kicked me out for coming out as gay, not even trans, and I had to do my transition alone. What I tell people is, if your family's not going to accept you, then maybe it's in your best interest to just wait it out. That being said, in Vancouver, you have so many resources and so many amazing people that will help you transition. Jasmine is gearing up to relaunch her YouTube channel. Motivated by her success in BC, Jasmine is eager to support her trans community around the world. Shaquille Majuri, in New Westminster, for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, the Vancouver School Board announces a new summer trade program. And a new art exhibit unites demons and angels for the first time. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Uh, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. A defining moment for me was when I finished my first internship and got lots of really great feedback from industry professionals. I would never imagine I'd be walking into the floors of TSN and thinking, I'm not a student anymore, I'm here to work. I will be starting a job with an investigative news program in Toronto and I'm really excited to see that grow into what will become hopefully my dream job. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, putting you to work. Museum of Anthropology debuted its latest exhibit this week called Heaven, Hell and Somewhere in Between. And as our reporter Madison Arota found out, this is not what you would typically find in an art gallery. 
The name of the exhibit, Heaven, Hell, and Somewhere in Between, is derived from an old Portuguese story. The exhibition is an experimental exhibition. It brings graffiti, uh, murals that are spray painted um, are, uh, in the, uh, on cities, together with pottery, uh, figurative work. We have masks of politicians, football club managers. We have marionettes telling the national epic of Portugal. The name of the exhibit, Heaven, Hell, and Somewhere in Between, is derived from an old Portuguese story. According to some, um, on birth, an individual is, um, uh, is given a saint on one side and an imp or the devil on the other. This portion of the exhibit represents hell. Behind me are projected numbers from the stock market crash in 2009, showing the struggle that Portuguese people had during this economic crisis. You have the traditional folklore type of art, and then you also have graffitis we see every day in our contemporary society. Um, I like the graffitis. Uh, I really learn a lot from their, their challenges and also their discontent. Shelton hopes this exhibit will change the way Vancouver is viewed internationally in the art world. We in Vancouver still have uh, medium size, a lot of medium sized galleries and museums. And I hope what this exhibition, not only this exhibition, but the whole strand of exhibitions that we've been doing, which are innovative, use different techniques, um, will start actually earning us an international reputation. Heaven and Hell will remain together at this exhibit until October 12th. Madison Arota in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Madison Aroda joins us now to talk about the museum and the art that was out of this world. Madison, what makes this exhibit unique from others? Well, Estefania, this exhibit is unlike any other in Canada. It features artwork from Portugal that's never been in North America before. The art that's being showcased includes 18th century church paintings and urban graffiti street art. Madison, how is the museum showcasing the art? So this exhibit is very modern. It actually uses light systems that are found in nightclubs. And what this does is it adds color and shadow onto the art pieces. Now this is only the second time that this museum has used this light technology before. Back to you. Thanks, Madison. One grade 12 Britannia secondary student is on his way to a career in the auto repair industry. But Vancouver teachers still say not enough students are getting into trades programs. As our reporter Tara Harvey found out, the Vancouver School Board is hoping a new summer program will help change that. Dean Nguyen was introduced to the automotive program at Britannia Secondary in grade 10 and realized then that he loved working with his hands. With something like this, a car, it was really different than, you know, carpentry. When you fix it and it actually runs after, there's like a sense of accomplishment. Is it? Yes, I did this. Wow. The VSB is hoping a new summer program called Skills Exploration will introduce more students like Nguyen to potential trades careers. In Vancouver we have some of the best uh, trades facilities in the province and many of them are being closed because of the perceived lack of interest in the trades in schools. So this is a, a really op great opportunity for students that don't have trades training in their schools to actually take a class in the summer and get hands-on into automotive. The BC government is projecting one million job openings in the trades by the year 2022. As a result, the province has announced more funding to be allocated to trades programs such as the Skills Exploration course. VSB teachers say approximately only 1 in 10 students in BC are currently taking post-secondary trades programs. So it's really important that the high schools take on a role in starting to have students interested at an earlier age. We need to have smart people in the trades. The future is not always clear for high school graduates, but Nguyen says programs like skills exploration are a helpful hand. You know, there's those students, there's those, those teenagers that go out of high school, yet they don't know what to do. So this is like guidance I think it would be quite helpful. Tara Harvey in Vancouver for BCIT magazine. A team of BCIT tech students has created a single rider vehicle to take part in the annual Baja off-road competition in Oregon. Our reporter Eric Blow talked to the team captain about his two-year involvement with the project. 
Adam Marsnack is putting the final touches on BCIT's off-road vehicle. When he first heard about the Baja event, he wasn't sure about getting involved. And at the beginning, I was thinking like, oh man, I won't have time for this. Like, I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to delete, delete the email. I'm done because there's so much stuff to do at school. When the team faltered and numbers dwindled, he had to take on a major role. And then January came, uh, you know, the team was down to like half its members. February came, the team was down to like five people or so. Added time and resources led to a resurgence of the team. It now has more than 20 members and they all recognize Adam's contribution. Adam was one of the key pillars of the project. Basically, he went over the rules and uh, had to know every aspect of the project, not just for his team, the drive team, but other teams. The competition isn't just an accomplishment for Adam's team, but a stepping stone for a program that's looking to build a reputation. Oh, we definitely hope so, and that's the thinking behind getting the second year students involved, um, and also the first year students are involved, and those people that are involved this year, hopefully will be able to carry on the program next year. Personally, I think that engineers as students, they should, before they leave, they should know how it feels to go from a start to finish in a project. Now, while the main event is a four-hour endurance race that's grueling enough to have you switch drivers two hours in, Adam and his team will be judged on things like acceleration, hill climb, design, and presentation. These two years of hard work just could pay off at the end of May. Eric Lowe in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Drawing on your windows may save the lives of millions of birds. And Nat Bailey Stadium is welcoming a new addition to its stand. The most rewarding thing for me has been the relationships I developed in the program, both with instructors and classmates. My sense of confidence has never, never been higher. I mean, this, this program has offered great opportunities to be in real world, real industry situations, and, and being in those moments and knowing. I can contribute, I can do this. It's exciting to be in this industry and to meet lots of great people and to make amazing friends. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, realizing your potential. Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news, today on BCIT magazine, striking. Make magic on a movie set, frame, and action or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. Welcome back. After opening a blind dining restaurant called Dark Table, Two owners are helping empower Vancouver's deaf community with their latest concept. Our reporter Sophia Perani takes us to Defined to see what it's all about. This is not your average restaurant. At Defined, the staff is deaf or hard of hearing, a one-of-a-kind concept in Vancouver with the goal of breaking down barriers of communication and offering employment opportunities to those who are hearing impaired. Olav Nas is a floor manager and feels empowered working in such a supportive environment. It's an opportunity to showcase and to raise awareness to see that deaf people are capable and they do have the skills. So it gives the hearing people an opportunity to learn how to communicate with a deaf person. They really don't have anything to be scared of. We're human beings as well. We're all the same. Owner Sami Musatat worked with VCC's Job Readiness Program and WorkBC to get direction on how to recruit staff for his restaurant. We wanted to employ more people um, with difficulties finding job and uh, we were very inspired by the deaf community and uh, alarmed by the uh, huge percentage of people that are unemployed. Uh, so we thought we can start this project. Uh, it's very exciting and everyone that is working here is really, really happy and eager to uh, make this a success. Interaction between staff and guests makes the dining experience unique. They get the chance to try out American Sign Language while ordering their food with illustrations in the menu. I think it's uh, very exciting for the industry and very exciting for those people who are sitting around and looking for jobs. Musatat says he hopes to integrate more deaf staff into the kitchen after the restaurant becomes more established. 
Well, to be honest, it was a bit uh, overwhelming at first, but it's been a positive experience. In Canada, only 20.6% of deaf Canadians are fully employed, a figure that is alarming for our country. Defined with its unique concept is hoping to change that statistic. I'm Sophia Pirani in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Many pet owners view their furry friends as part of their family. So when a pet goes missing, owners are left heartbroken. Sergio Vargas has more on the BC SPCA's solution to this issue. Lost cats like Patrick are a regular occurrence at the Burnaby SPCA. The shelter takes in a variety of lost animals including cats, bunnies and puppies. They are now hoping they can get them back to the rightful owners a little faster with the creation of a new registry. The BC Pet Registry was uh, created this year because there was no uh, registry of its kind. Everybody, if you had a microchip pur purchase at a certain provider, a lot of them were going out of business. Then you were losing that information and there was no way to trace those uh, microchips. Voltalinen has been with the SPCA for over 18 years and managing for the past five. There. One more and then that's it. He says animals with pet identification have a much greater chance of coming home. Last month we had 20 stray dogs come in. Out of those dogs, 19 of them were claimed because they had identification. With cats, it's a little bit less. Anyone's with ID, typically, were able to get them back into their home a lot quicker. As for the cost of the new registry, customers have a couple of options to choose from. And the doctor actually has a choice of choosing between annual registration, which is about $12 value, or there's lifetime protection for about $45. Adoptive parents James and Kayla have added a new member to their family. They seem to be okay with the cost of the new registry. Yeah, we would just because of where we live and the possibility that she could get out or could get lost. So If I'm adopting a, a, any animal, it's um, I'm welcoming him welcoming it to my house and it's going to be a member of my family so I'd want it to be safe in any manner. I'd definitely be able to put out a little bit more to have that security I guess. So be it dogs, bunnies or cats, the new registry is looking to reunite pets and their owners. Sergio Vargas in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. We are, no, we are now joined by Sergio Vargas. Sergio, can you tell us a little bit more about the microchip technology? Yes, Amar, the microchip is actually loaded with the registry's information and implanted into the animal. Now if found, the SPCA can simply scan that animal and figure out what registry it is from. Now this technology isn't new. What's new is the provincial-wide registry that they have implemented. In the past, they would have to sift through numerous different registries, some of them that have actually gone out of business, which made it hard and in some cases impossible to find the owners. They are now hoping with an online registry, it's going to be much easier and faster to reunite pets and their owners. Back to you. Thanks, Sergio. Bird Week is a celebration of the 250 different species that live in Vancouver. Reporter Lena Tanahara went to a workshop that aims to save the lives of birds through drawing. Here at Hillcrest Community Center, these kids aren't just drawing colorful dots all over the glass windows for fun. They're actually preventing birds from crashing into windows. They don't see the window as being a, a surface, so they see it as uh, either a reflection or something they can fly through. And so what we're doing is creating visual markers in order to see them actually as a surface. Up to 42 million birds annually die in Canada through window collisions. So awareness and prevention are key to conservation efforts. Generally about birds, people don't realize is that they are indicators of ecosystem health and so they're around us all the time and we can see them and we can and there's lots of people who count them and so it's a good way to, to see how our environment is doing by how birds are doing. Here at the Wildlife Rescue Association, they regularly treat birds like this little one that have injured themselves after crashing into glass surfaces. Well. We of course have treated seabirds that have um, oil pollution on them. For example, the re recent oil spill, we treated three buffleheads from that incident. And but about 20% of our intake are from birds that have crashed into windows. So drawing dots on your windows like this actually helps prevent birds from thinking that they can fly through the glass and recognize that it's actually a hard surface. That will help prevent millions of bird deaths every year. I'm Lena Tanahara in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. 
The first pitch for the Vancouver Canadiens is right around the corner. And as Kurt Morgan reports, Nat Bailey Stadium is getting a facelift. The Major League season is already underway, and the short season single-A Vancouver Canadiens are on deck. Their campaign gets going in late June, and the crews are hard at work to have Nat Bailey Stadium ready, including a set of brand new bleacher seats in left field. Media director and voice of the Vancouver Canadiens, Rob Fay, explains what prompted the addition. Well, for the last couple of years, we've been fortunate in the fact that we've had a bunch of sellouts, which is obviously good for business, but it's not good when you have to turn fans away. So uh, what we thought and what we've been working on for years is working with the city of Vancouver to try and get the new rezoning so that we could add seats. So we're going to add about 1,200 seats this year, and hopefully that means that uh, although we may have fewer sellouts on paper, we've at least gotten all of our fans into the stadium. The addition of 1,200 seats to this already tiny ballpark, you may think that some in the area would be concerned with the additional traffic that would bring, but from everybody that we spoke to today, they think it will only enhance the ambiance of this special place. Did we have any resistance? It was really minimal. I mean, you got to remember this stadium's been here since 1951, so a lot of the people that have moved into this area kind of knew that it kind of came with the territory. It won't really affect us. We live five blocks from here, but I think transit in this area is really good. SkyTrain station not too far away. I don't think so. You know, the, 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 everybody's got bikes pretty much a lot, and then with the pool and everything here like that, you know, I mean, you're bound to get some traffic, so, you know. You really can't complain about it. The fans are going to be right on top of the bullpen, so instead of it being along the third base line, now it's actually going to be along the left field warning track. And uh, what that means is you get to watch these guys warm up and you get to see what a 95 mile an hour fastball looks like. Kerr Morgan in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. The long overdue makeover of the ballpark will also include a new patio area where fans can eat in comfort while enjoying the game. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program, please visit us online at bcat-broadcast.com or bcatbroadcastnews.ca. I'm Estefania Duran. And I'm Amar Khan, and that's today's BCIT magazine. Thanks for watching. We, we now leave you with footage of the observatory at Simon Fraser University.